Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Open Philosophies, Open Science Tools in an Open Research Ecosystem. I'm Ethan, uh, I'm the EBSCOM Marketing Manager, and I'm the ma moderator today. My colleague, Abel, Abel Liu, uh, will help me with Q&A session in the end of today's webinar. And before I introduce our two speakers, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. The first one is today's webinar is being recorded. We will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with colleagues or faculties. Second, we also invite your comments and questions. Please look at the Q&A chat box on your screen. If you think of a question for speakers at any point, just type in there and we will hold it for the discussion portion at the end of the event. At this time, I'm going to hand the floor over to Professor Jen. She is the assistant professor at the Department of Library and Information Science at the National Taiwan University. Uh, she is going to start today's presentation. Professor, it's all yours. Thank you, Easton. Does everyone see my screen right now? Yep, looks great. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Hi, everyone. My name is Wei Jin. I'm currently working in the Department of Library and Information Science at National Taiwan University as an assistant professor. Thanks for EBSCO for inviting me to talk about my favorite topic, which is open science. I worked in the open science related topic since my PhD study uh, back to uh, 2010s at Pittsburgh. And now I'm still continuing working on open science topics, especially research data supports and services for researchers across disciplines, which I currently have several classes at NTU and my research projects, it's mainly centered on them as well. Based on my observation this year, I've been visiting, talking to several uh, library teams in academic library in the US, Netherlands, Switzerland, and so on about their reaction to the open science movement, like how they establish their services and how re they react to the uh, scholars need, uh, something like that. So today I'm going to share what I see and uh, what I saw and what I thought. Let me start with the conclusion. I'll talk about three things in today's talk. The first thing I would like to mention is how the open science movement encourages researchers to share all the research product. Most importantly, a researcher doesn't have to and should not wait until her study is accepted. The sharing behavior are able to start earlier in the research processes. I'll talk about this more later. And the second thing is that, as I noticed a major of our audience today are librarians. Uh, I would like to talk more about how libraries and librarians can react to data intensive science and open science culture uh, based on my observation in recent years. Finally, I'll see how much time I still have and I would like to share my team's work with you and the implication I got from those projects, mainly centered on the emerging technology, how, how the emerging technology shaped the open science culture. So first of all, I leave the Chinese character because I noticed that uh, some of the audience are from uh, Hong Kong and Japan. So the kanji should be uh, easier for get the concept. So the data incentive uh, science is a concept that since we have witnessed that the technology is advancing daily, we have even faster uh, processors, even larger storage and high performance computing power today. And so these days, people do not worry the storage or the connection issue very much and more data comes in all scales and shapes, uh, comes from uh, every uh, scale and every levels of uh, laboratories. So the academic in institution and individual researchers getting more and more data that's indeed a picture of data intensive science. We might need more supports 
and services to react to this. So moving toward a researcher Lyon proposed a three exit model of open science based on the perspective of data intensive research. The first dimension you can see in the picture is participant uh, participation. The dimension related to public engagement where the spectrum, we have the spectrum here between the single research work and then the middle point would be the teamwork and final at a scale we would like to invite more citizens into our research. So we have citizen science. The second exit, transparency, means a researcher not only gives a product access to the public, but makes complete research materials, data, source code, uh, clearly documented and available to everyone. So outsiders are much easier to learn and replicate the procedures from the other team. Today, I plan to focus more on the dimensions of transparency and open access. I just wanted to remind the word access here means everything. So in the past, we are used to uh, getting note that the open science is based on the journal article after published or the preprints, but actually the, the access here means all the products, including data, videos, audios, whatever that derived from the project. So let's take a closer look at open science in the past. Here is a research life cycle that probably fits many disciplines practice. At the early stage, the, uh, the 12 o'clock uh, position, you will see design and idea, which means uh, a researcher developed that idea or try to gather some other things to put the research ideas done. And then he or she might try to discover the literature and collect the data, analyze the data, write down the result and get published. So it's kind of the really generic life cycle. In the past, we have been used to think of open science practice is to open up our research product, such as preprints and published articles. That's fine, but sharing behaviors usually happen after our manuscript got accepted or even published. However, in recent years, this R words have become the elephant in the room kind of thing across discipline. The R words are repeatability, replicability, and reproducibility. So the first word, repeatability, meaning whether the same team can run the experimental procedure again to obtain the same result. If not, it will sabotage the credibility of their study, right? And the replicability, it doesn't have to be the same team. An outside team is running the same procedures and the same procedure is a key of this turn. That means the procedure can be run again. So the focus won't be the result. As of the result, we would like to introduce the term reproducibility. A team is obtaining the same result, no matter what kind of method or procedures are taken. But recent year, I would like to remind everyone, more and more disciplines tend to mingle the concept of reproducibility and replicability, and or use, just use them interchangeably. For example, in engineering fields, they use the word reproducibility to cover all the meaning uh, between replicatability and reproducibility. And in psychology field, they use the replicatability to stand for reproducibility in the common sense. So it still depends on the discipline practice. The word shouldn't be like really well defined is still, we save the space for discipline to interpret it. We should know that research that is not reproducible or not replicable, um, it costs misconduct or bias and not only waste our investment and it can be wasted. So that can jeopardize the uh, credibility of the entire research community. It's really a uh, serious problem this year. With this R words in mind, let's go back to the life cycle again. We have to admit that sharing products at the later stage is not very helpful to avoid those R practice crisis and generate a questionable research practice. 
the questionable research practice described that this kind of the practice with problematic flaws, such as uh, a researcher manipulates the p-value of the uh, variables or conceals the hypothesis after finding significant result. So after they find the result, don't, they went back to uh, revise their hypothesis or selectively just report the good results, they neglect the negative result. And the publication ecology also selectively publish the good results. They don't tend to accept the negative result. I would like to note that the questionable research practice it are, should not treat like a fraud or misconduct here. I, uh, because, uh, but still problematic and negatively influence our science. So we can also agree that it would be really difficult and somewhat meaningless to reproduce a study where there are a bunch of questionable research practice. Okay. So today's open science movement, like I already mentioned, researchers are encouraged to share their products earlier in this life cycle, we can put it up to the early stages like data collection or even earlier, uh, the first two stages of idea design and discovery. If some of you in this talk are liaison librarians for uh, chemistry or biology, you probably feel familiar to uh, see the term pre-registration. Uh, we will talk about more about the pre-registration practice in a few slides later. Other research products uh, during the life cycle include the protocols and uh, experimental protocols. And for sure, we have the uh, preprint sharing. And also right now in the, uh, during the open science movement, we have the open peer review kind of mechanism. And we even share our data and make sure every product has a DOI so we are able to track. So that become today's open science. Now you may think uh, researchers probably need lots of supports of all that. Yes, the academic library undoubtedly play a really crucial role in this new culture. Here I would like to quickly mention a list of library services regarding the open science movement or the uh, data research data support for individual researchers. So from the beginning of the life cycle, you will see there's a consulting services for writing the data management plan or help the PIs to budget their data management. They set up the data management or other uh, set the budget for the data storage uh, fee. And in the middle of the stage, uh, the librarian can help individual researcher to uh, analyze their data or access really special data such as GIS or some chemical uh, structure type of data. And then librarian are able to give the recommendation for the data repository selection or the protocol uh, platform selection. Uh, researcher uh, has an opportunity to share their protocol on the right public, uh, right platform and fits the journal values request. And the librarian can also, in this context, to suggest the metadata and standard instruction to help researcher decide what kind of information, what kind of descriptive information should put into their data set. Also the tracking data thing, they can guide the researcher how to track and mint the DOI for all of their research products. I'm not planning to introduce every service here because it's surely worth being another hour long talk. But here I find a more efficient way. I would like to use a persona, Potter, who is a, um, who is a kind of pseudo persona that I would like to introduce. He is a third year assistant professor working in the medical school at NTU. I would like to use Potter's case to demonstrate how the researcher can bring open science tool into his research process. So in the beginning, most of us are really familiar with 
Potter's team might use Mendeley or Zotero this kind of bibliography tools to manage all the literature he discovered. Then he used a protocol that I owe this platform to memorize and manage or even share their lab protocols. So here is a screenshot of the protocols that I owe in some version. And phenochloroform is a method of, to extract DNA. So if you can see the left pan, you can see the metadata of the protocol, uh, kind of the study and the author team. And you see the step, there's a number system here. And on the right side, you can see the uh, dashboard for ma uh, monitoring the progress. So right now, uh, the screenshot shows that uh, the PI or the researcher are uh, executing the second step uh, out of the 10 steps of the experiment. And there are some little check marks on the right. So once a researcher finishes a step, they can check and go to the next one. There are some little tools here, like a timer, like a recipe. You can just have an iPad or a laptop with you and you can finish the procedure with the protocol.io. Most importantly, once you confirm the protocol is good enough, you can even share that or just submit with your journal paper submission. And then Potter's team use OSF pre-registration this platform to uh, document his uh, uh, pre-registration document. So OSF pre-registration is a site that uh, author can submit a document and the document is about uh, PI or the author team can just write down the study hypothesis, proposed method, important parameters such like sample size and p-value so that won't cause too much p-hacking or HARC that we just mentioned those kind of questionable research practice. And another way Potter can do is to submit a registered report to the journal. It is a new kind of journal submission that author team submits a pre-registration document pretty much cover the similar elements I just mentioned, but the journal ha have to, uh, the journal had to find the reviewers to review the presentation and see if accepted or not. The, the magical things happen. Once the presentation report got accepted, no matter the result is positive or negative that Potter is carrying, the journal should publish the result in the general case. So that costs, um, that kind of reduced the risk of the publication bias that I just mentioned. Potter's lab can also use an electronic lab notebook such as SignNote, where uh, this is one of my interviewees told me that they, uh, they are from the biology uh, field. They said they use a BioVia notebook to document every details and milestone in their, during their experiment settings and that kind of result. Potter's lab also can use uh, OSF to generate an anonymous link to their data sets and submit with their manuscript. So here you can see on the left-hand side, the contributor is anonymous contributors. So uh, they will mint a link in, with the anonymous authors and your data sets down here. The reviewer can just access and review the data set accompanied with the manuscript. The, the switch is really easy to on and off. If, if we got accepted or got published, the contributor can be unblinded. So the author names come out, it allows user to turn the link into a public and show the author name. So everything will keep in the same page. That would be somewhat really convenient. So finally, the good news is Potter's uh, manuscript got accepted. And there's also good news to Potter and Potter's library. Since his registered report was accepted to the certain journal like PLOS One or PLOS 
biology, he got fifty percent deduction for the article processing charge. The APC is fifteen percent off. So please keep in mind that Potter's persona is just a case that try to put slightly more open science tool into it. It doesn't mean that a regular uh, researcher will adopt this much. So. Uh, in the following few slides, I'll quickly share some of my team's research, how we design and implement a framework to help researchers to manage and track details in their research progress. So I'll talk about some of my team's experience and observation. So after taking on um, uh, talking with more than 50 researchers across disciplines, especially the biomedicine fields and social science. Um, in the biomedicine field, I have molecular uh, biology and they have really special culture. And um, we have design, design and develop a decentralized framework called Blockchain for Life Cycle Transparency, BLT. So the Backend design was already done, and there are three um, features. Since we adapt the Ethereum, the ETH, block, blockchain technology, so we adapt the smart contract into the framework. As you can see, we have three feature and um, most common condition here. So first one, the research team is able to use a smart contract to track the timestamp. For example, we have really significant milestone or we have some really important times that, that like we would like to track when we got all the patients uh, consent form, that kind of big event. And also we can track the condition. For example, for the journal, uh, journal site, they would like to set up the condition that uh, please do not submit your manuscript until all the author agree the submission, that kind of condition, or do not send out the invitation to your participant or your patient until the IRB is approved. That kind of condition can be automatically tracked to, to save the labor consuming. The final one is my favorite one, is a time constraint. We can also put a time constraint to enhance our reproducibility and research transparency. For example, we can have a rule that one time should happen earlier than another time. For example, the hypothesis was registered. So the result, even the result unknown, we cannot go back to revise our uh, hypothesis. So with these three common features, we hope that tech, uh, blockchain technology can somehow help open science movement in terms of the reproducibility and research transparency. And uh, the back end was done uh, is a done design, and we are working on design the front end. So I think I can share more in the other year. Uh, actually, this Friday, uh, uh, it, it will be tomorrow, uh, we are going to test and talk about uh, our uh, front end interface to a um, molecular biologist tomorrow. All right, so beside the blockchain technology I just mentioned, my project researchers also mentioned some possibility for technology may change their day-to-day -day research practice. For example, Internet of Things, there is a, a concept called born open data, which means that the instrument itself links to the data repository automatically. So once the instrument uh, surveys something or uh, generates some data, it's all the way nonstop sent to data repository. That saves a lot of time, but I put a little marks here it's to save or to consume more labor because sometimes we will have the fear. What if we couldn't calibrate the instrument really well? What if the data is wrong and the data already shared or open to the public um, immediately? That caused some fears and more, um, more consuming of labor if something is wrong. 
right? So this can be the discussion, but I would like to inspire everyone that some team are practicing the born open data. And um, I feel it's a really interesting topic. And the AI and natural language processing technique, um, in this situation, many researchers in my project talked about they really hate and bother to put the metadata in their data set. They think they are the most uh, knowledgeable uh, team in the world to understand their own data, that's for sure. But once the knowledge should be uh, moved to other team or they have to write down a lot of metadata, that causes problem in time. So they thought that maybe the NLP technique can help them to automatically uh, abstract, do, doing the abstract, uh, put the metadata into the right fields, and all they need is to check if that's right or wrong. That will save some uh, time for them. So that's another possibility. So here I would like to remind that we still have opportunity for those emerging technology can help. Okay, so final slides, final a few slides. Uh, here I would like to talk about the action on open science. For the researcher in the uh, information school that I felt who are interested in open science, like I mentioned in the uh, earlier slide, you may be interested in how emerging technology can shape and support the future of open science. Uh, feel free to, uh, if you have interest in this topic, feel free to study and even develop some tools for helping. For journal and publishers, you may want to pay attention to your peer venue or your discipline venues, how they already adjust or adapt the open science movement. See if they try to accept the new kind of submission like register report and see if you would like to, <clears throat> sorry, see if you would like to adjust uh, the open science movement words. You uh, Here I have some keywords for you. Uh, the top guideline and top factor uh, is an initiative that help the journal or publisher to check if their uh, author guideline and journal policy fits the research transparency and reproducibility movement. For individual scholars, you might want to recognize, discuss, and pay attention to your discipline and see if your discipline already have a culture or uh, how they act, react uh, with open science movement, or if they have a really useful tools for enhancing the research transparency and reproducibility. Finally, the, uh, the most importantly for our audience, for librarians, uh, I think we can still recognize and discuss a lot for the open science movement since it is a trend and we can pay attention to our paid trend, um, see if they have the needs or request toward the open science practice. And we can also help them to try out some open science tools. If they are so useful, we can just introduce them. Here I give you some keywords like a research data services, DMP, which is the data management plan and pre-registration I just mentioned. OSF is a really uh, good platform. Protocols.io is a well-known platform that archive and uh, sharing and help uh, researchers discover different things protocols. And the site notes is a most uh, unknown, uh, sorry, most well-known uh, electronic notebook tool. Here, one thing we can comfortably sit down and fence and watch right now is a uh, University of Florida actually seek for the uh, reproducibility librarian. So we wonder if a new job position is created. The job uh, description says the candidate is expecting to develop the national recognized program, which help the researcher and other librarian to develop the reproducibility services. And also this new position uh, needs to provide a consultation services uh, to their institutional patrons about their transparency and reproducibility practice. 
And <clears throat> here is another resources for librarians who are interested in open science and data science. I have the QR code here. So after the, this talk, the, the video will be shared online. You can follow the link and see how the framework, uh, sorry, how the platform uh, collect the resource about uh, developing the library and workforce for open science. So this is probably my uh, uh, reference and thank you for listening. Okay, thank you for your sharing, Professor. Um, our next presenter is Mike McKinnon, our Director of Science Innovation. Mike, over to you. Okay. Thanks so much for sharing, Dr. Zheng. I appreciate that. There's actually a lot of uh, synergy there with uh, the things you're talking about, both for OSF fundamentally, as well as what you're doing uh, within NTU. I have to say, I'm very interested in the blockchain, uh, being able to show provenance of where research comes in and auditable uh, functionality where say milestones are met or alerts happen along the process. That's fantastic. So uh, congratulations to your team there. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share um, my desktop. Hopefully everybody can see my screen as it tries to do an update that's not timely. Um, so hopefully everybody can share or see my screen here. Uh, what I'd like to do today is I'd like to first go through um, some slides. We'll see uh, talking some similar topics with what Dr. Jang just covered. Um, but then I'm actually going to dive into some live environments on some tools that we have that really support the OSF fundamentally as a framework, but also support uh, uh, EBSCO's partner initiatives around OSF. So in that vein, um, as a topic, EBSCO has long recognized, and you know, I think the librarians on this call, you've long seen um, that there are constraints within a research ecosystem, both for the, the institution as well as for the researcher. Um, the institutional priorities, particularly around grant visibility when grants come in, not just on the uh, reproducibility need, um, but also on uh, ecosystems of sharing, particularly amongst either partner labs or partner institutions, or even uh, globally, if you're doing work that's say being funded and has a mandate for uh, being produced um, green, open, then well, you, you might want to make that research uh, requirement to meet the funding requirement as well. So um, there's research requirements around meeting institutional missions for uh, open science. And then the researcher has uh, their own challenges as well, particularly when you look at, and, and I know Dr. Jang talked about um, Synote, that there are like ELNs, there are toolkits that um, are within uh, researchers' grasps. But oftentimes they're um, um, constrained by the platform. So, um, and it's not, you know, in a negative way, it just simply is the, the lack of interoperability across from one data area to another within um, either the department or even within um, uh, the research office as they aggregate um, both publications and research grants and research activities at a holistic level. They, they may not be able to get all of that data into one place both for the researcher and for the institution. So just a lot of challenges there um, as data continues to, the research exhaust, the data continues to be um, uh, growing. And now we're trying to uh, make a fundamental shift where we can be more collaborative with OSF. Uh, we really need tools that help frame out that ecosystem, that help support that ecosystem. So what I plan to talk about today is really compartmentalize three areas that EBSCO has focused on that really follow along that OSF uh, narrative, um, particularly not necessarily about uh, the discovery portion. So Dr. Jang showed you the um, research life cycle wheel. Uh, we also talk about that in some of the other talks that we do, uh, particularly EBSCO's been involved in those uh, elements around discovery, around uh, publication, whether that's dissertations and theses or working with primary publishers or working with open access. Um, we've been involved in different areas of that ecosystem, but the areas that we really haven't had tools to support research in general is particularly focused on the data exhaust. So um, the ability to not just store data outputs with 
um, um, say metrics and drivers around a particular project, but the code and the computation and the compute required to run that uh, project over and over again for the reproducibility requirements. Um, the ability to create and track protocols, so the methods, the step-by-step -step nature of research so that one lab can uh, uh, recreate the, the work that was done in another lab or even run the same, you know, the same lab as Dr. Jang noted, uh, might run the same project over to verify or validate the work that they've already done. That method tracking is something that is very important. Um, and then lastly, something that, you know, we didn't really cover so far today is the preservation of that research work. Um, and now preservation can mean lots of things within the institution and particularly within a library. You have archives, not only for say collections like historical collections or heritage collections. You also have uh, uh, archival collections generally around um, um, either say like uh, accreditation needs or uh, uh, research requirement needs. So you may have um, things about faculty tenure and how long they've been there or um, historical grants that they've won and not just the publications and the outputs, but who was participatory on those teams and, and all of that nature. So there's this different long, uh, long cycle preservation uh, area of research that also needs to be covered. Now, two of these methods really fall under that open science uh, uh, framework where they do offer openly available services that you don't need institutional license to go and use as an individual. But as soon as you start scaling services, uh, whether the, they're about, I need more compute space or whether it's, um, I need to be able to uh, privatize or lock down some of the research methods because of either funding requirements or institutional requirements, um, that there becomes this institutional um, uh, use of these services that isn't that openly available. So it's a, a, a cross-platform uh, support where we want to really support open science, but we also recognize that there's needs that uh, uh, do prohibit stuff to be open. We want to support both. So um, EBSCO has partnered with some services that, that do just that. So first we're going to cover uh, code and data. Now, um, as mentioned early on, one of those very first slides and something that Dr. Jane covered is we have uh, publishing outputs and the publishing outputs, uh, you know, historically have been the driver, have been the thing that we're looking for. Um, and those can be openly available or uh, they can be um, uh, put in, a, say, a primary publisher's uh, a journal and uh, be behind a, a paywall in some, in some way. But one of the things that's not there, that's not found traditionally is not just say a data set because data sets can be included, but how to get to the data set. So that computational code. Um, some research groups in the past, if it was published open, may put uh, um, code bases on GitHub or some other uh, repo uh, repository. And the repository could be within uh, an institutional um, um, source a hosted service institutionally within the lab, maybe, or even within a shared um, uh, access point across multiple institutions. Um, but uh, putting it somewhere where it can be embedded directly into the article and be run in a separate environment, that's a, that's a whole new thing. And that's really what CodeOcean brings to bear is that our, uh, our outputs that we're used to don't support, traditionally don't support the ability to have the code and um, uh, the methods with which we got to these outputs embedded right within the article so that another group may be able to reproduce them. Um, and that may even be a peer group where they're trying to do a peer review and they want to run a test to make sure that that um, has some validation, the original uh, um, uh, outputs have validation. That's great. Um, it may be another group who's trying to replicate um, uh, the research done in order to uh, leverage it in a future project, right? So the ability to reproduce it. So we need a platform to be able to do that. And that's this uh, first partner we're talking with, uh, we're talking about, which is um, a Code Ocean. We're also seeing publishers um, really support reproducibility. And you see here on Science Direct on the left, the new uh, implementation of our badges where publishers are labeling articles whether or not they're in an R-badged 
So this is a journal, Software Impacts is an R badge articles within Software Impacts. And you'll see that right directly on the publication. When you click into the publication, it'll actually deliver you right down to the code used to reproduce this. And as a peer process, it has had to have this test pass to be able to uh, qualify for the R badge. So I think it's a great forward step in being able to have reproducibility um, as a requirement. Well, maybe not a requirement, but we're getting there <laughs> as, as something that's really sought after uh, with uh, research publications is, is the ability to recreate and reproduce uh, the results of, of work being done. So CodeOcean is um, one of EBSCO's partners that we're talking about today. Essentially, it is a, uh, a hosted code repository that has um, a compute engine embedded in the code. So unlike GitHub, where you may go out and, and either build out code or uh, deposit some code, and then have to have a local machine that has the right environment to say run Python or run R or uh, uh, something else. Well, I, I don't need that with CodeOcean. I actually have the run environment right in it. And I am actually going to show you that right here. So hopefully you can see my web browser. Um, here I am in an IEEE article. And uh, coming down through this article, of course, I can get access to this. But underneath code and data sets is the ability to see this code capsule. <clears throat> from Code Ocean embedded right into the article. Now I could go ahead and read through what this readme might describe. This is just a widget that they've plugged in, or I could launch uh, Code Ocean directly and see this capsule. Here's the run environment. Maybe I want to see which files are associated with it. So I could see um, uh, the Docker file if I wanted to go see the Docker environment and anything around there. Metadata elements. So I know Dr. Jang, you said one of the most difficult areas is doing the description work associated with uh, research. But that work at this point is still very needed. And NLP is fantastic uh, uh, from a machine learning standpoint. And NLP EBSCO is using that as well with some of the editorialization work that we do around uh, metadata. Um, but I think that at this point, you know, still having authority work contributed to uh, research articles is, is going to be necessary. Um, and adding them here not only uh, helps us for discovery, but it helps make sure that uh, we get down to the right articles relevant to the subject matter. So having nice metadata descriptor work in here, including a DOI to the publication or any affiliations uh, correlated with this research, it's all great. Um, I can even come down and I could see what my result sets are. So if I wanted to see some of the different uh, visuals or images about this item, I could see uh, all of this right from that article. Now, if I wanted to run it, I could even come up here and click and run this to recreate or retest um, the data with the values that have been entered for this capsule. Um, so I have real quick um, accessibility, particularly for me, if I'm in a lab and I'm trying to share with another group that may be outside my lab, um, or maybe I'm just sharing globally. And so there is some geographic boundaries, but I have a partner who we may be working in a live environment together. And not only could we screen share in something like Zoom, but we could be working collaboratively on the same capsule here and be looking at values together. So um, a really enabling platform for being able to store the code and, and rerun um, uh, this capsule to, to be able to uh, uh, reproduce the work that we've, we've continued to work on. Um, I will say too that uh, the ability to have uh, high compute, high throughput, or even a virtual private cloud if you wanted to, those are all uh, functional areas that CodeOcean can enable institutions on. So if you have a huge amount of output or you're doing lots of work that does take um, uh, a lot of space, those are all available. This is all hosted on AWS. So the throughput is simply a, a throttling uh, thing that we can control, uh, well, that CodeOcean can control. And um, uh, that way there is no constraints. It's not something that now you as an institution need to go to your IT departments and ask for more uh, OPEX or even CAPEX to buy more uh, space or 
uh, throughput. This is something that's um, uh, leverageable within your uh, subscription, institutional subscription to, uh, to CodeOcean. <clears throat> okay, go back to here. So that was uh, uh, the um, open science framework uh, support that EBSCO is doing around Code Ocean for code and data reproducibility. Another area is around the protocols, is around the methods used to reproduce the research work that's done. This is often the biggest hurdle, and that we know that uh, uh, universities uh, often have um, uh, good services around. IT support. Um, that's part of where a lot of the research grant dollars go is to be able to fund more and more uh, research institutionally. But the step-by-step -step tracking of it, particularly if you're trying to do uh, historical work or leveraging historical work in something new, that's really a struggle. Um, I know that in that, you know, we, I keep mentioning here, but going back to that um, uh, research life cycle, that, that very first part of it where you're doing discovery to try to find articles can often be really difficult. And that's where you know, librarians were able to come in and help researchers uh, uh, refine um, their search and discovery process and get to the tools that they need. Um, but that's still a pretty daunting step. So if we had a framework that was open and not open just within a specific ELN, a specific platform, but open globally, then that would enable much more discovery and much more reproducibility around the step-by-step um, uh, processes that would be outlined within a method or within a protocol. So um, I'm going to go ahead and show this live as well. Uh, Protocols.io is similar to CodeOcean in that there is um, uh, open, um, open, uh, open source uh, services for individuals. Um, but for institutions, they may have uh, separate or specific needs that uh, require either privatization or require more scaling. Um, and that's where those institutional licenses come into play. Um, so here I am, I'm at a PLOS One article and it doesn't have to be PLOS. There's um, lots of different um, uh, journals out there that are supporting uh, protocols embedded capsules. But if I come down here, I'm gonna see uh, a pro uh, protocols.io link um, and if I wanted to get to say even the, the code, it's there as well for Code Ocean. Uh, but if I click on this, this will take me right to protocols.io to view a protocol. Now in this, this is this step-by-step -step methodology used to create this work. Notice that, um, you know, I can have a, a personal profile here. I can actually copy or comment or make notations right directly within the protocol so that if I want to uh, um, uh, reproduce this work or I even have a query, maybe I'm doing something tangential, but uh, there's something that's been defined in this work that is applicable, I can come in here and I can ask, ask the original authors or contributors about specific steps in um, this, uh, this protocol. Um, this protocol may also have uh, different versions. Somebody may have, um, uh, taken an, uh, an original protocol, say for uh, something like Ebola, and used original steps for the Ebola protocol in uh, COVID-19 uh, protocol methods. And in fact, that is actually what has happened in some cases, um, where they've been able to leverage existing work to apply it to new research processes. So some real fantastic OSF fundamentals there where the open source or open science framework has helped us enable past research to do, to do new work. Um, I'm also gonna jump into another protocol that I brought up here. Um, in this protocol, again, I could uh, maybe look through prior versions. I could go ahead and take an existing protocol and fork it. Maybe I wanted to simply export this to some local tool while I read or reviewed it. Um, I could do that. Um, I could even do a comparison, sorry where I could compare different versions of it. So maybe I had bookmarked this or saved this, or maybe this was my protocol and I was working on it collaboratively with another institution. I could come through here and I could see what's changed since my last um, engagement here. Here's some open community questions. So I can come in and see where this notation was given. Um, notice there's a question about what the edit is and hey, we can see what their reply was. Looks like there's a typo, no problem. 
So this kind of open engagement is really that OSF fundamental that I think is, is of really high value there. Um, I'm gonna do one last thing and I'm gonna come to um, a workspace. So uh, one thing that protocols.io lets you do is not just have the individual protocols, but you can have large workspaces or small workspaces. So a large one might be an institutional workspace where across the entire university, you have um, a lots of different segmentation by discipline or segmentation within specific labs, um, but you can get a high level view of what's happening for you organizationally. Similarly, in a distilled uh, uh, workspace, you can get just to those relevant to my, to my work area, but I may be able to see what a colleague is running that I haven't been focused on at all. And so I can come in and browse across, see some of the different uh, protocols that have been here, see what's um, uh, been applied of late and maybe even leverage it for work that I'm doing. So it does have um, a real nice uh, um, administrative or uh, um, oversight purview, if you will, in, in addition to the uh, individual use cases. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna come back into here. Hopefully everybody can see my slides again. Um, and then lastly, talk about the desire for uh, preserving the work that's been done. So we've been able to say, well, uh, the code and data is just as important as the article because we need to make sure that not only is the code and data uh, helping enable OSF globally, but it's also helping, helping enable visibility to our research teams, visibility to our university, and uh, making our output um, that much more scholarly and reproducible. So lots of great things around code and data, but the methods are also fundamental to that. Though there's the long tail there about being able to preserve that work too. Um, output though, as mentioned, Earlier, doesn't have to necessarily sit with just the research lab. In the context of this session today, that's what I want to focus on, but it could be uh, a preservation or it could be an institution wide where you need preservation uh, across the gamut. So, what uh, EBSCO has done is we have partnered with um, a UK based company uh, called Archivum. Um, Archivum uh, leverages Archivematica, the open source archiving platform for a lot of the framework with, it, with which it provides manages services on top of the platform for. The advantage with, with leveraging this open source framework of Archivematica is the standardization of formatting for long-term preservation. So if I'm going to ingest an object, maybe it's a, a data set, maybe it's a code base, maybe it's images or video around research that I've done, I'm able to standardize the framework with which it gets stored so that at a future date, if, if an image goes from JPEG to TIFF to something else, well, whatever that next uh, um, framework is or whatever the next um, uh, object type, I can go ahead and still open that item and not be locked out. If you've ever used tools like, uh, you know, beta to, um, a VHS, or if you've looked at, say, a, a Blu-ray versus um, a HD DVD, right, that the formattings can, it, over time, can be a barrier. And that's something we don't want to have, particularly across the wide selection of objects that might be in, in preservation. Now, additionally, Archive, uh, Archivum allows us to connect, really, to any of the tools across the institution. So creating a workflow of ingestion, and a workflow of safeguard and preservation is very flexible. If I have multiple resources I'm gonna ingest from, whether that's a repository or uh, whether it's um, um, even say like, like a hosted uh, research output storage uh, area, well, whatever that mapping is, I can go ahead and define that institutionally and uh, Archivum will be able to pull that data in and then set up outputs so that um, the preservation happens and discovery happens as well. Uh, this is an example here where an object gets entered into Archivum. Uh, it's given a unique identifier. It comes in as a docx, but as we know, say uh, WordPerfect, uh, <laughs> if you ever use WordPerfect, um, saving it as this particular file type might not be preservable in a long-term future. So moving it to a PDF A for archive is an appropriate thing to do for a text file. Um, and following those open source standards really makes it so that 
Uh, we're not getting locked into a single vendor schema. We are following uh, global schemas on how to manage and track archives. Um, it's microservices based in that uh, you get a, a, I suppose, modular based and that you get to choose which module um, you use within Archivum, whether or not you need uh, an intermediary like an escrow service, whether or not you need these integrations with all these different um, uh, systems you may have institutionally. It's kind of a, um, an a la carte uh, offering that Archivum has. Um, and ultimately it allows uh, you to have choice over what it is that you want to preserve, which is part of the OSF framework is the preservation of research. Um, so we EBSCO is partnering with lots of different vendors uh, in the open science framework and uh, will continue to do so. It's something that we think is definitely part of mission statements of uh, universities as well as um, uh, libraries specifically. And that's what I have on my talk. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for your sharing. So we already have several questions that have been submitted. Uh, and uh, as a reminder, if you have uh, any question that you have not yet submitted, please enter it in the QA box and we will get through as many questions as time allows. Hello, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Abel. Um, this question goes to uh, Dr. Jane. So uh, the question is, uh, which team in the library should get closer to the open science affairs, subject librarian, scholarly communication librarian, or others? Uh, thank you, Abel. Uh, actually, I got the same question in the last uh, lecture that I have. So thank you for asking this question. I, I do not know the generic situation, but I can take my mother school, uh, University, of uh, University of Pittsburgh Libraries as an example. They develop uh, uh, three layers of services. So, uh, sorry, it's three levels of services. So the basic level, which is the librarian who has to facing the patrons, uh, public facing the patron. That's a level one, which is the basic awareness of open science. And they have the second level, which is the subject librarian and liaison librarian. They have to know uh, and provide some advanced RDS, research data services, uh, basic, basically. So they are able to know how to suggest the repo repository for uh, individual uh, disciplines. And then they have the core team, which is a newly developed, uh, newly developed team called um, Digital Scholarship. So they have the new team and they are all specialists toward the open science and research data services. So they only have like three persons and they have the specialties in GIS data or the library information science. They can write down the consulting report or they can interview their patron about their practice and suggest they can do uh, whatever they want, such as the budgeting in their uh, grant writing and also provide the research data management plan consulting. So if your question is, uh, which team should be more related. I think that uh, comes to your own library uh, organization. If you would like to create a new team for this, that's perfectly good. And you can still gather some uh, interested persons like from the subject librarian or some outreach team. And you can get it with a special mission, that kind of stuff. And all see how your institution work. So my experience is based on the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jen. Um, okay, due to the <clears throat> limit time, so we may not be able to cover all the questions. Okay. So the next question will go to Mike. Um, due to the intellectual property issue, 
can the user uh, use the private cloud of CoOcean and Protocols IO? Yeah, sure. So if an institution has, particularly around funding, if an institution has needs to lock down a research process, um, then uh, virtual private clouds are uh, certainly something that you can use in both cases. Both protocols.io can set um, um, uh, private constraints around their deployment as well as code ocean. Um, there is some, um, I suppose, uh, technology requirements in that they still both leverage AWS, so they would need to leverage an AWS environment somewhere. Now that, that could be an AWS node more regionally uh, um, in proximity to your institution, but even within AWS, they can set it where it's a, a private framework. So, so that should still be uh, serviceable. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mike. So uh, we may have to um, get, the, get to the last question. Um, this also goes to Mike. So the question is, um, what are the programming languages supported by the CodeOcean? Uh, so right now CodeOcean supports, I wanna say 14 or 15 languages. We, there's a list that's publicly accessible from their website. So it's quite a bit. Um, and honestly, from an IT perspective, if I was campus IT or um, even uh, IT research uh, uh, personnel, uh, that's more than I probably would deploy on uh, some of the specific machines that I would support, right? I may support five or six or something of that nature, but I'm not gonna support a dozen plus. Um, and, and this is one of the advantages with using a scalable service where you uh, can take the burden off of IT and you could use a service that um, just has all that toolkit built in. The other advantage with using it where it's all built in is it provides a long-term viability. So uh, code you know, uh, shipped 12, 15 years ago is probably gonna be developed in uh, C++. And today C++ is not used nearly as much as it was uh, a long time ago. Putting something into CodeOcean will allow you to use that um, code that maybe has been deprecated or replaced with something more modern and still be able to run that research in that, that environment without having to go find out how do I need to deploy C++ on my local machine. Okay, thank you so much, Mike and Dr. Jin. I'll hand over the session to Ethan. All right, so thank you everyone who joined us today. And Professor Jen and Mike, thank you for sharing your insights and your experience. So if you have any additional questions or would like to contact directly with us, you can either reach out to uh, your EBSCO people or contact us our, or visit our website. And please answer our post-event survey. It will pop up when you leave the meeting room. And OK. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful day. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.